Hello, everybody. Welcome to the European Freedom Network uh, webinar for this evening. Um, I hope you're all doing as well as you can be in this difficult time. Um, so um, today we are looking at um, respite in the storm. So today's webinar is really looking at how we look after ourselves and those who work for us and alongside us on the front line in those difficult times that we're all experiencing now. And we have some great speakers lined up today. Um, so I hope that you all get something out of the session. Um, we have some interesting tools and resources as well to share with you. Um, so what we'd like to do um, before we do anything else is to start with a little kind of check in with ourselves. So we have um, we have a poll for you, which will come up very shortly. Um, and we're basically looking at, um, I don't know, in America, we have they have gas tanks. And what we're saying is, how full is your tank right now? Now, in, in the UK, we might call that a petrol tank. <laughs> I'm sure there are other words in other countries, too. Um, but have a little think about how your energy levels are, how you're feeling. And, and maybe try and select a, you know, is your tank empty are you absolutely exhausted or are you actually okay but a little bit tired you know and just select where you think you are right now just so we can get a little self check-in really really important uh, part of looking after ourselves is knowing how we are feeling and what our tolerances are and they're very different for different people so has everyone had a go at that if so, lovely Richard, Are we, can we put the results? Okay, okay, so a couple of, a few people feeling empty, a um, few people a quarter, most people seemingly about half, half full, um, and a few people who are yeah, feeling very full. So lots to think about in terms of our energy levels there. Thank you for that. Bear that in mind as we go through the session today and let's see how we move forward. Now, those of you that were here before um, at the session, I think the webinar before last, um, we talked about uh, trauma and some of the strategies for helping victims of trauma to cope. Uh, I apologise, Garfield would like to get involved in the webinar. Um, and... Um, and so, and um, so you will be familiar with some of the speakers, but we have a few new people joining us this time. Um, and I'm just gonna ask them to introduce themselves because you've not met them before. Um, so Marion, I wonder if you can pop on and just say um, a, a, a sentence or two about yourself and then, um, and then Jerry and then Sue. Thanks, Cara. Um, good evening from Watford, North London. My name's Marion Nell and I'm a cross-cultural training consultant, but for many years I've uh, been teaching uh, member care or staff care around the world, uh, lots of tough topics, but about seven years ago, I started to find a focus on refugee workers, teaching, about, teaching them about uh, trauma response and self-care. And since like, the end of last uh, August, I'm also involved with the 400 Afghan evacuees in my town, that's me. Great. Thank you, Marion. And then Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, good evening. I'm Jerry McNamara. I'm uh, connecting in with you today from the south of Hungary, from the beautiful city of H. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Katty. We have three daughters and a grandson. I originally qualified as a psychiatric nurse, and later on, I went to do studies uh, through the University of Sydney and also John Hopkins uh, Hospital. Uh, in the area of trauma care and, and psychological uh, first aid. Um, I have a great interest and in this evening I will be talking about how we look after ourselves uh, physically so that we can care for ourselves mentally. And uh, I have great interest in uh, healthcare and how it affects our mental health. And I have a lot of experience in it as a, not only working in healthcare, but also as a former national powerlifting champion and a black belt in Taekwondo, I see the importance of exercise and sport uh, and, and diet as it affects our mental health. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jerry. And Sue. Hi. 
Oh, here she is, having a few technical challenges. So we're glad yeah. that you're with us, Sue. <laughs> okay, sorry. No um, my, my name is Sue Austin. I am training lead for Zimbabwe Without Orphans. Um, I am an adoptive mom and a foster mom, um, um, but my context here is um, in the area of trauma, obviously. Um, our training team um, capacitates caregivers, um, social workers, teachers, policemen, um, various stakeholders. Um, our focuses are developmental trauma in children um, and child protection. Those are our two main focuses. Um, and then I work with Love Justice in Zimbabwe, which is an anti-human trafficking uh, organization. Um, so yeah, sim simple, just capacitating people around us, helping people to do better, helping people to care for other people. Thank you, thank you, Sue, that's great. And um, as we said before, uh, as I said before, we also have the speakers you will have met previously, which obviously is myself. Um, we have Nancy, Shan Shannon and Sarah, and Sheldon is joining us this evening from the EFN core team. Um, Jennifer is here. She's working in the background today and helping me with the questions. So thank you very much, Jennifer. And um, delight delighted to have you all board. And you've, you've kind of corralled us all together to prepare this workshop. So thank you. And also just want to say a brief thank you to Richard, who's helping with the technical stuff and a reminder um, that we do have interpretations in a range of languages. Just at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a little sort of world-shaped icon that gives you a range of interpretation and options, language options. And just to say thank you very much to the interpreters for joining us. And um, we will all as speakers do our absolute best to speak slowly and clearly for you. Um, I've just realized that I had forgotten to do that earlier on. So thank you very much. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Marion uh, now, who is going to talk to us about the biblical basis for self-care, a subject that she has a lot of expertise in. So thank you and over to you, Marion. Thanks, Caro. Um, so many people may be asking, well, why are we talking about self-care? It's not a popular topic in Christian circles. Self-care's selfish, isn't it? Certainly that was the message I often received when I taught at a Bible college in Ukraine for three years running, and also from my Romanian and Bulgarian uh, colleagues. One pastor told me that as a matter of pride that his phone was on 24 hours a day because his people needed him. I somewhat wondered if it, the reverse was not the case. And there is somewhat of a Messiah complex in the aid and refugee communities. People want to save the world, and they seem to forget that Jesus has already done that. This is one, some of the things that I've heard people say. I'm just going to share, try and share my screen with you. Sorry. I felt I couldn't stop help. I couldn't stop. Uh, helping because people needed me. My family and friends found it hard to talk to me. I became angry and frustrated with normal life. And that mirrors what a lot of people say. Whatever we do, my friends in Ukraine would say to me, well, where is it in the Bible? And they'd be quite right, because whatever we do, we should have a biblical basis for it. And Jesus himself said, love your neighbor as yourself. That implies that you should love yourself. So how did Jesus practice and model self-care? Well, I've just picked out four areas in which he did this. And the first one was solitude. Very many times we read that Jesus went off for time with himself, for himself and time with his father. We read very early when it was still got up, when it was still dark, Jesus got off and went to a solitary place. After he sent the crowd away, he went to a solitary place. Often he withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So solitude. And the second one is socializing. Jesus liked to be with people and he made sure he took time off to be with people. Very often we read of incidences that happened when he was at someone's house, at Matthew's house, at Simon the leper's house, with Mary and Martha. 
So he took time off to socialize. And thirdly, he had a support group around him. We read in Luke's gospel of the women who, who went with him, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna. And they were there to support, and they even helped him out of their own means. And lastly, he had significant others, a small group, Peter, James, and John, that he took, took with him. Uh, the verse I've quoted there is the transfiguration, but you can find it time and again. It was a small group with whom he felt he could be vulnerable. And as we are in Holy Week this week, of course, we're reminded that it was they who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane when they heard him in this raw prayer to his father, please take the cup from me. So solitude, socializing, support, and significant others. And if Jesus needed that, why should we think we can do it any differently? But secondly, Jesus had boundaries. Boundaries are a protective and a positive thing to have in one's life. He had boundaries on his relationships. In response to family demands, he had created a wider support network so that he wasn't always the go-to person. He wasn't the person who always had to be there 24 seven. When he dealt with opposition, he, um, he, he had wisdom in the ways that he talked to the, those who were opposing him. The Pharisees tried to, tried to trap him, but he's not gonna let himself fall into their trap and eventually they went away and left him alone. He had boundaries with the authorities. When he comes before Pilate, Pilate is looking forward to an encounter with him. He wants to kind of engage with him, play with him or whatever, but Jesus gave him no answer. He knew when to keep silent as well as when to speak. And then fourthly, he had that great skill of delegation. We read in the feeding of the 4,000 that the disciples come to him and say, well, what are we going to do? What are you going to do about this? And Jesus says, so what have you got? How are you going to use that? And then with the, uh, when he sends out the 12 in Mark's gospel, we read that he gave them instructions as to what they were do, to do. He prepared them and trained them for what they were going to do. And when they came back, he debriefed them. He said, so how did it go? What happened to it? But he didn't think he had to do it all himself. And lastly, he, he, re he recognized that he had limited capacity. He says this in John 5, 19. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. And I wonder how much are we of what we are doing is what God has told us to do and how much are we re responding to the demands of others. So if Jesus needed boundaries, why should we think we need to do any different? And self-care of course, didn't start with Jesus. It started at creation. God created humankind on day six and rested on day seven. So the first thing that we did was to rest. And mankind went out to work from a place of rest. And many of us have reversed that creation order. Lastly, Jesus gives us an invitation in Matthew 11 in the message version. Are you tired, worn out? burned out on religion, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And Nancy is now going to take us through some definitions of things that might stand in the way of those unforced rhythms. 
Over to you, Nancy. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Marion, for reminding us and taking us to the biblical thinking of why it's important for self-care. Today, we want to look at several um, issues and several points when we talk about self-care. One of them is being overloaded, and one of them is secondary trauma. And the other one that we would like to talk about today is compassion fatigue. And I would like for you to just even think, as we did that poll earlier, are you experiencing one of these areas in your life? What does it mean when we say we are overloaded? Overloaded means that we're trying to do too many things and we have too much responsibility without getting enough rest. We're overburdened. We have an excessive load so that our thinking and our behavior is becoming impaired. Maybe we feel angry or we feel sad all the time. Maybe we are feeling tired and irritable. Maybe we even question the truth of our faith. Maybe we're not interested in our work anymore. Let's look at what secondary trauma looks like. Secondary trauma is when we listen to people's stories of trauma and grief. And many times we absorb some of their pain and we experience some of the same symptoms that they are experiencing, such as reliving or avoiding, or being on alert all the time. Secondary trauma is not the same as being overloaded, but a person could be both overloaded and experiencing secondary trauma. The main difference between traditional trauma and secondary trauma is that the individual experiencing secondary trauma has not witnessed these traumatic events that have occurred. Rather, they're dealing with the aftermath of it. And you know, the most common symptoms of those who experience secondary trauma um, are not limited, but they might include some of the following. Maybe there is grief. Maybe there is anxiety or denial and anger. Maybe there's irritability or even that feeling of hopelessness. It's like they're on that grief journey that, that the person with trauma has experienced themselves. There's a loss of purpose. And many times this is where we see addictive behaviors such as drug, drugs and alcohol um, being used. You no, know, in 1995, C. Figley said, we do not, we have not been directly exposed to trauma, to the trauma scene, but we hear the story told with such intensity, or we hear similar stories so often or we have the gift and the curse of extreme empathy and we suffer. We feel the feelings of our clients. We experience their fears. We dream their dreams. And eventually we lose a certain spark of optimism, humor, and hope. We tire. We aren't sick, but we aren't ourselves. So what does compassion fatigue look like? 
compassion fatigue is the draining of that physical, mental, and emotional energy for those of us who care for traumatized people. Typically, it creeps up on us, and it's often characterized by burnout. But basically, it's low-level, chronic clouding of caring and concern for others in your life. It's the ability to care for others that becomes eroded through overuse of our skills of compassion. There's emotional exhaustion, there's mental exhaustion, there's physical exhaustion. It affects many dimensions of our well being. There's behavior and judgmental impairment, and there's depression and possibly PTSD. It's a loss of our self worth and emotional modulation. We lose hope and we lose meaning. And eventually, sometimes we become anger, angry towards those people that we are caring for or the events that have happened. If we look at the, if we look at the resource, When Helping Hurts, we, hear, we read, first you should understand that compassion fatigue is a process. It's not a matter of one day, you're living your life with a great deal of energy and enjoyment. And the next day you wake up exhausted and devoid of any energy, both physical and emotional. Compassion fatigue develops over time and it takes weeks and sometimes years to even surface. And basically, it's a low level chronic clouding of caring and concern for others in your life. Over time, our ability to feel and care for others becomes eroded through the overuse of our skills of compassion. And we might experience an emotional blunting whereby we react to situations differently than one would normally expect. So I'm asking you today, think about, are you overloaded? Are you carrying secondary trauma? Or are you living with compassion fatigue? I'm gonna now turn it over to Sue and she's gonna come and talk to us about environmental factors and resilience. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm so sorry, I've had to switch to a cell phone because my laptop is, um, I am just having a technical wonderland over here. Um, so I am so sorry, I, but I hope that this will still be something that, um, is interesting and beneficial. Um, tonight we're talking about how to manage our own um, situations, our own stresses, our own overloads perhaps. Um, and one of the things that I um, wanted to just chat a little bit about um, was about our environments and how our, the environment that we're in can become a protective factor for us. Um, I work um, in a very high stress job, a very um, high levels of responsibility, um, a lot of people depending on me, but my workspace is very protective for me. And it, if I look out of my window, I see green, I see trees, I see green lawn, and that's a very protective thing for me. It helps me to feel safe. It helps me to feel like I'm in a comforting space, in a nurturing space. Um, and I just wanted to share a few things with you and really just submit some ideas. Um, I certainly, this, there is so much to this. There's so much content to this, but just to maybe give you a few ideas that might be helpful um, and that you can use in your workspace that you could possibly use even in your home space. Um, have a look at those two pictures. Can you go back please to the two? Thank you. So if you have a look at those two settings, the one on the left 
to me, I look at that and I am, I feel anxiety looking at that. The one on the right, there's, there's less clutter. It's very clear space. It's a very calm space. And sometimes if we are working in high pressure situations, we're dealing with people who are hurting, we're dealing with very traumatic, very life-threatening things. If we are working in a, in a workspace that looks like the one on the left, or we're coming home to a work to a home space that is more resembling the one on the left, that can, can be something that drains us even further. And there are very little things that we can do. There are small things that we can do to adjust our environments, our actual physical environments, so that they become um, protective for us. If you look at the one on the right, that one looks like a soothing space. That looks like a place where I could be at ease. I could be at peace. I could take a deep breath and kind of reboot my energies. But the one on the left, that would make me feel quite distressed, I think. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, just a couple of things to consider. Um, in our workspace, in our home space, and I, I realize that there's a broad range of people on this call and you may not have um, influence over changing all of these things or changing many of these things but there might just be one or two things that you could change that might actually make a difference and might make a difference for you um, a couple that i would love you to be aware of there hydration and nutrition are really essential um, we know from science and from neurobiology that when our bodies are hydrated and when we are nutritionally cared for, that our bodies can experience regulation, a much better state of regulation. And um, my friend Jared is going to talk a lot more about that after me. But um, if we are not hydrating properly, we will begin to our capacity to access um, the, the upper levels functionings of our brain, our executive functioning, our um, reasoning, our even our communication skills are, are potentially diminished. Um, so a suggestion might be in your workspace, firstly, are you personally hydrating and, and getting the right nutrition? But you might want to consider having something in your workspace, in your church space, um, where there's regular access um, to hydration and to nutrition. Um, you might want to have a water stand, you might want to have a tea stand, um, something that your staff, something that your, your, your carers, your workers, I don't know what your situation is, but where people can hydrate on a regular basis, maybe have a snack, but even if it was just a bowl of fruit, if it was a bunch of bananas, that may be something that people can use to hydrate. We use that with children extensively. Um, to help them regulate and access their upper level thinking. And um, being aware of sensory differences and intolerances. And um, this is something that you, you may be able to uh, change quite easily. Um, so we all have sensory um, tolerances and sometimes we overload and it's a sensory issue and it causes us to be dysregulated. So for example, I've put this sound um, and uh, music smells. Um, if you're working, for example, in a place where there is um, very loud noise or it's aggressive noise or it's, it's noise that is jarring, you may want to consider putting earphones on that bring a softer, gentler music. Um, or perhaps that block out sound altogether. Those things can help us. Remember that our, our brain receives the information through our senses um, and that, that uh, those overloads can cause us to, to, to be um, dysregulated within our physical bodies. And that affects the way that we work. It affects the way that we think, it affects the way that we reason and, and our decision-making, those kind of functions. Um, the visual space. Um, much better to have an environment that is um, lighter, that's brighter, that's pleasant to look at. You're going to have better outcomes in terms of decisions, in terms of um, people being able to work longer hours. Um, and I mean, as I said, these apply to work and to home. What is, what is your home environment like? Is your, is your, the place that you sleep in, the place that you rest in? Um, and I know we don't always have control and I please forgive me if we're not, um, if this doesn't apply to you at all um, or it's not in your control, but these are just some suggestions. 
Um, the next one, is there an option to move or to get physical activity or take a break? This is really a critical thing. And again, my, my colleague is gonna speak about that after me uh, much more uh, in depth, but our, uh, we can get stuck. Our bodies can get stuck. Our brains can get stuck if we are not moving or, or able to at least take a break physically. Um, and that, you know, if somebody's sitting behind a computer and they're behind that computer all day, is there an option for them to get up and leave? Is there an option to even just walk around the office? Is there an option to go outside? If you're sitting in a truck all day, um, is there an option for you to stop and, you know, walk on green grass? Is there an option to, you know, take a walk in, in the country or around the block at least? But that physical, that proprioceptive input that you give your body, it helps our brains to reset and, and to come to calm again. Um, sorry, I've lost my computer, so I just need to focus again. Okay, is there enough airflow? Is there enough oxygen in the room or are all the windows closed and all the doors closed? Is there enough flow of air in the room? And then plants and nature. Um, you know, if it's an office environment, um, if it's a warehouse that's been turned into an office or a church that's been turned into an office, maybe putting a few plants would be helpful. Bring a little bit of uh, greenery. Those, those visual inputs actually help our brains and they help us to, they, 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 they create our environments to be more supportive for us. So just a few ideas there on environment being um, a protective factor. And you know, what, do, what happens when you go home? Do you, if you are going home, if, you, if you're serving and you're going home, are you, uh, is there a quiet space? Is there some way where you can decompress a little bit? Is there, um, you know, is it, is it a, what, what ministers to your body? What takes care of your body? And that's something that we all have to figure out. Um, but environment can be a hugely protective factor. I just want to touch on resilience for a little bit. Um, slide, please. Um, and the, the definition of resilience is up there. And I think sometimes when we're in stressful situations, um, we can become very overloaded. And I think it's a good, it's a good opportunity for us to remember some of the resiliences that we do have and to remind ourselves of some of the things that we do have. Um, the definition of resilience is the capacity to successfully flow through any disruption or challenge that comes your way and bouncing back in the face of adversity. So we're not saying that hard things don't happen. We're not saying that, that tough times are not there. But we're, we're, resilience is the thing that helps us move forward. It's the thing that helps us to get to the other side. Slide, please. And then protective factors, um, conditions or attributes, skills, strengths, resources, supports, or coping strategies in individuals, families, communities, or the larger society that help people deal more effectively with stressful events and mitigate or eliminate risk. So that's what a protective factor is. One of the things that I think we, slide please. One of the things that I would love you to think about um, is the people. We have a, all of us have a resource of people. And um, where I come from, I live in Zimbabwe. Um, so we often will say to each other, who's your tribe? Who are your people? Who are the ones that are there for you? Who's your village? Um, and this is, this is a, just a little visual to show you um, some of the people that you might have in your space, but who are the people that you can go to? Who can, who can I turn to? My work colleagues are some of my wise, some of my rock, um, definitely some of my helper. Um, but who are the people that we can look to? And those people are a resource. Those people are an asset to us. And I think sometimes we, we have to remind ourselves of the people that we have in our lives. Um, a slide, please. Um, this is just, I mean, this is a very long list and I have no intention of going through all of those with you. Um, but we made a list of these as a team and these are assets. And sometimes when we're in the tough and we're in the trenches, it's, it's, and we feel like we're, we're drowning or we feel like, you know, what, why am I here and what am I doing? Sometimes it's good to remind ourselves of the assets that we have. Um, and just a few of these um, on this list. Um, 
for me, one of the, the important things is um, a religious community. My, my church community, my faith community, that's a huge asset to me. But sometimes I forget that when, I, when we're overwhelmed, sometimes we forget about that. Um, what about your family? What about your, your mental well-being? Um, that's an asset. I, I can think clearly. I, I can find solutions. Um, I can think uh, through this situation. And I, I think it's just good sometimes to stop and even take a pen and paper and write down some of the things, some of the assets that you might have forgotten that you have. Um, Sue, I think, Sue, I think we need to move to the next speaker if you can just uh, finish yep, up. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, that is my last one. Thank you. Um, so in just a, a few points there in building our resiliences, um, do we have a sense of purpose? If we're doing something as a job or we're doing something out of a sense of purpose, if we have purpose, that will help us get through. Um, can we develop problem solving skills? Am I self-aware? And I know that colleagues are gonna speak about that soon. Um, do I know what works for me? Can I learn new things? Are there new skills that I could learn to help me get through this? And am I managing change? And how could I learn to manage change better? Thank you so much. I hope that some of that was helpful. And I am going to hand over to Jerry now. Thank you, Sue. Uh, especially well done to you with all the technical difficulties. I'm sure everybody appreciates how difficult that was for you. Interestingly, when this whole crisis began uh, with our work here in Hungary, we have a lot of contacts into Ukraine and our ministry with both the Set Free Movement and the Free Methodist Church were very much involved with work in Ukraine. And those first few days uh, for me, and I'm sure just like for most of you, were incredibly stressful. And certain areas of my life really weren't in a healthy place for the first few days. Uh, that was sleep, because I certainly wasn't sleeping as well as I should have. Um, nutrition. My diet wasn't as healthy as it should have been, and I was certainly rushing my food. And finally, exercise, because I was spending so much time on the phone or in front of a computer or, or in front of the television screen. And so I want to talk a little bit about that this evening. and I'd like to share a little bit about the importance of all of that. Um, and so I'll be talking about nutritional psychiatry. And this is a relatively new field uh, of study in the science of psychiatry, looking at how food links into psychiatry, into our mental health. I'll also be looking at the importance of exercise as it affects not only our body, but our mental health and sleep also. So the importance of good nutrition and exercise along with sleep cannot be underestimated in helping to keep us healthy in both body and mind. They're just totally linked in together. Now, your meals should always contain multiple colors. And I'm not talking about multiple colors of M&Ms or uh, Skittles. Now, I love M&Ms, but they're not particularly nutritious. So what we want to do is when we're looking at different forms of food, what we want to do is on our plate, we want our portions to have different colors. So you don't want your food to be all one color. You want to look at it being yellow, white, green, red, etc. You want the, all those different colors because each of those colors generally represent some type of benefit to your body. Uh, and they allow you to get a certain amount of uh, vitamins and minerals. And some foods have more uh, of others as, uh, of vitamins or minerals than others do. So for example, typically with yellow fruits and vegetables, they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So if you've got some type of inflammation in your body, uh, yellow fruits and vegetables can help with that. We know that particularly dark le green leafy vegetables can be very high in iron. Uh, and we also know, for example, that there are many red fruits and vegetables that have good benefits for your heart. Eating a regular balanced meal not only will fuel you physically, to work and it'll fuel those that we are working with, but it will also give you an opportunity to sit and rest. Rushing your meal, which is something I often do, rushing your meal is not of benefit to you. In fact, what it leads to is undigested food, which leads to stomach issues. Take your time, relax, 
it's incredible when we read the Bible, how much time people in the Bible spend around a table sharing food together. So use that time to share food, to bless your body and to bless your soul as you fellowship with others. Make sure when possible to have protein in each meal and your protein doesn't have to come from meat. So if you're vegetarian or vegan, you don't have to get your protein from meat. There are lots of other good sources such as beans, lentils, uh, spinach, really an incredible amount where you can get that. And it's a wonderful way to give you energy and strength for your day ahead. Consider taking a probiotic supplement every morning. Why? Well, with nutritional psychiatry, what we're seeing now is that the use of a probiotic in the morning will help combat depression. Our gut, our gut health has an impact on our mental health. So consider using a probiotic. Uh, something else, if you're not able, or for our, for example, right now, if you're working with people who are in Ukraine and they're not able to perhaps access probiotics, uh, certain types of yogurts, natural yogurts, Greek, Greek yogurts may have some of that benefit to it if they're able to access it. Take a multivitamin every day. Uh, deficiencies in vitamin B, C, D, and E can lead to uh, worsening depression. And they can also have a negative impact on your cognitive function. So it's harder to think and reason. If you have a low functioning thyroid uh, in the Greek and in the Hungarian, because I live here in Hungarian, the word for thyroid is shield. And our thyroid is that. It's a shield to our entire body. So if you have a low functioning thyroid or you're worried about your thyroid, take a selenium supplement one a day, it will have wonderful benefit in helping you. Because not only does the thyroid affect us physically, but if we have a low functioning or poorly functioning thyroid, it can lead to mental health illness also. The Mediterranean diet, which is a very popular diet, has been incredible, uh, incredibly well shown to reduce depression. In fact, those people who uh, regularly take uh, the Mediterranean diet are shown to have between 25% to 35% less cases of depression or lower depression than those who don't take part in the Mediterranean diet. And a while ago, there was a funny comment by someone called Mark. And Mark wrote uh, in, in response to what Sue had said about uh, drinking coffee. That, calls, uh, that counts as hydration, right? <laughs> and I'm afraid we're looking more at water. However, there's a lot of benefits to coffee, right? Drinking black coffee is excellent to help fight against diabetes type 2. It's also helped to break down any potential uh, kidney stones that you have. Uh, there are negatives to it as well. If you get cold sores or uh, herpes on the lips, it will contribute to that. So really our nutrition or diet, what we take in, it impacts our body incredibly. In relation to exercise, make sure you exercise on a regular basis and you should be aiming all of us for between 150 to 210 minutes of moderate exercise a week. Moderate exercise means you're sweating, you need to take a few deep breaths. And exercise can take whatever form you like, uh, but preferably what you want is to have some strength training every week, what we call resistance training, where you're lifting some form of weights, cardio and some form of stretching now it's really up to you what you enjoy doing because we're not top athletes the vast majority of us but we do need to be physically fit to help people uh, as much as we can and especially for those of us who have colleagues working in ukraine we need them to continue to stay as physically fit as possible and eating as much healthy food as possible um, so feel free to do table tennis, go swimming, go hill walking, getting outside is wonderful for your mental health. Go to the gym, uh, walk your dog, but get exercise on a daily basis. A 20 minute walk outside has been proven not only to lower your blood pressure and to lower your weight, but also it helps fight depression. That's incredible, just 20 minutes a day. Go longer, get more benefit.
Yeah, coffee fights kidney stones. It does. Black coffee, not coffee with milk or sugar. Somebody's writing up a comment there. Uh, and when possible, exercise outside so you get the benefit of vitamin D. And vitamin D will turn to melatonin, which will allow you to sleep. And if you're traveling, do take a melatonin if you're able to get it. Just three to five milligrams of melatonin will help you get into a better sleep pattern. And so exercise, just to finish off with exercise, it's been shown to have benefits in reducing not only your blood pressure, your weight, but also anxiety, depression, and stress. Now, finally, just going on to sleep, you want to keep a regular bedtime. Go to bed at the same time every night and get up at roughly the same time every morning. At the weekend, you can have a little sleep in, but it shouldn't be more than 30 minutes of a difference. You want to keep quite a regular bedtime when possible. Limit your screen time before bed. Right, turn off the TV, turn off the phone. Those screens are not doing you any good. And set up a pattern of the same thing you do for the last 30 to 60 minutes every night. That may be sh uh, going for a shower, uh, reading, listening to some light music, but shut off the screens. Go to bed. Now, one thing you might want to do for an hour before bed, if you're able to get lemongrass tea, uh, which is very popular here in Hungary. But if you can get lemongrass tea, it's excellent for reducing uh, stress. Uh, it's also excellent for helping with cramping in the stomach, particularly uh, for young women who might have menstrual cramping. Uh, and so uh, these are really beneficial to you. Drink those uh, before you go to bed. If necessary, wear an eye mask and use earplugs. Depriving our senses can help us to sleep. And for people who have certain um, trauma, uh, that they've gone through, uh, perhaps coming from the, the war now in Ukraine, depriving their senses can also benefit them because we want to reduce auditory and uh, visual hallucinations or sounds that they may uh, hear. The use of lavender drops on your pillow, some people also find that useful. All of these can help you to get a good night's sleep. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Shannon. And uh, she's got a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Gerald. I wish we were around a colorful table right now, or maybe going for a walk together. It's wonderful to be with you again. And I'm just going to pick up the thread that Marion left us with the idea of unforced rhythms of grace. And we'll return to in these moments to God's word, to uh, a scene that inspired us as we've been praying for you all and planning for this time together is um, from the gospel of Luke. It's repeated in all of, all of the gospels, this scene. And it became the theme of the um, presentation. Uh, title with a Rembrandt painting of Jesus in the storm. I want to mention before we go in to the passage, something that I've observed by um, over the years, caring for people and being on multiple sides of a crisis, is that as humans, we tend to be partial in the way that we look at um, the situation. We're quick to make a, a judgment about what is um, worse or, uh, yeah, to evaluate. It's just part of uh, how we, we measure and process life. And we're using often our, our standards and, and, Unfortunately, this usually limits love because um, in contrast, in the compassionate heart of God, there's no place for weighing out comparisons, degrees of suffering, or, or uh, in this way, minimizing um, some of the things that Nancy shared with us about uh, trauma definitions and what we're experiencing. So I just want to invite you as we return to this passage to um, see the passage as a, as a window to know more about 
who God is and and invite you just to enter with us through the compassionate heart of God, that knowing that um, he is beside you, he's endlessly supplying grace and peace because of Jesus. Right now, the reason uh, this painting is significant to me and has been to us is because we recognize that um, many people can relate to the disciples. Jesus invited him, his disciples before this passage to join him on a mission of mercy. They're going to cross over to the sea, uh, cross over the Sea of Galilee. Um, I'm going to, I posted in the chat, the passage, if you want to read along with me, it's from Luke 8. Jesus told them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Whenever things come at us suddenly, we find out what's in our hearts. This is what it means to be uh, human. Back to the passage, then a fierce windstorm came on the lake. They were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up saying, master, master, we're going to die. This same fear and panic caught the disciples face loomed over us. Their emotions, we don't have any reason to believe that they were experiencing life in, in very different ways than we experience today. So let's spend a moment with this dramatic painting that was inspired by the passage from Luke. What happens to you when you look into the power of the storm, the tilting of the boat? Is there an area of the painting where your eyes are drawn? Maybe you find yourself up in the left-hand side or in the side where the men are pulling strenuously on the ropes. Maybe you're like this uh, man and who's leaning over the side, he's sick. Are you someone who's closer in the relative calm around Jesus? Or maybe you might feel as if you are in the water. The miracle that is about to happen is suggested by the way Rembrandt, the painter, uses light and shadow. Can you see? He got up. Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, so they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. What is God saying to you now through his word, his living word, through this painting? How do you want to respond today? Who can you uh, tell uh, what and how you're doing? Thank you, God, for your compassionate love and the companionship of the Savior. Please help us center our faith and confidence on you. Amen. Now uh, we get the pleasure of hearing again from my new dear friend, Sarah. She's going to lead us into some more practical ways of caring for ourselves. Thank you, Shannon. I don't know about you, but every time I look 
at that painting, I find my eyes drawn to a different person. Uh, for me, this time, looking at it, um, I found myself drawn to the man hanging onto the mask for, for dear life. Um, but I think there is so much in that painting for us to be able to reflect on uh, and bring before the Lord. So thank you, Shannon, for uh, bringing that to our attention. At our last webinar, one of the things that we mentioned briefly was to think about self-care in terms of A, B, C, awareness, balance, and connection. And I just want to spend a little bit of time unpacking what that looks like. When we talk about awareness, as Sue said, awareness and being self-aware builds our resilience. It actually increases our capacity to be able to cope. And this includes awareness of not just our feelings, but our self, our personality. Are you more introverted or extroverted? Uh, you may find this impacts your capacity, particularly if you are in a situation of hosting people in your home, as an introvert, you may need to be more attentive to your needs for space and solitude. Are we someone who likes to do things a certain way or a little bit more go with the flow? Because this as well can influence and affect how well we can cope. It's important to be aware of your own level of empathy because people who are highly empathetic absorb secondary trauma a lot more easily than those of us who may not be quite so empathetic. So if you are a very empathetic person, you need to be aware of that and be able to put some safeguards in place to protect yourself. What are the things that trigger you, that, that make you feel overwhelmed? How do you react? When we think of our fuel tank, the poll that we did earlier, what are the warning lights for you? What are the things in your body that indicate that you are starting to feel a little overwhelmed? It's important to be aware of your limitations. Like how much can you do? You can't do everything. In fact, there's often very little we can do to help. But what are your limitations? When is it time to ask somebody else for help? And being aware of our capacity to cope, to be doing regular fuel checks. How full is my tank today? I'm feeling about three quarters full today. Or... I'm feeling like I'm on my way to empty. When you're on that side of your fuel tank, you need to be more aware of the situations you are in and the safeguards you put around. B is for balance. And many of the things that Jerry shared with us uh, come under this category. The importance of keeping balance in our life. And I know often when we are in a situation of of caring for people in crisis and the intensity that that can mean we are involved in that sometimes it's very easy to get out of balance. So it's important for us to be intentionally thinking about the physical aspects that Jerry mentioned, making sure we have a nutritious diet, we try to exercise, that we are sleep we are being aware of. But it also involves things like being balanced about taking time out and time away from the responsibility of caring because caring can be hard and it can sometimes feel relentless. So the importance of balancing that intensity of caring with taking some time out on your own, even if it is just to go and sit in your bedroom with the door closed and read a book. It is important to be intentional about balancing the seriousness of what we are doing with fun. And sometimes it can feel really difficult to give ourselves permission to actually laugh 
to look for the joy uh, in the world. We, we forget that, but it is important to be bringing the, the life back into our spirit, um, to have time with family, to have time with friends, to not sacrifice ourselves for those we care for. When we balance sort of the seriousness and the intensity of caring we, with things that are life-giving, it actually increases our resilience. It gives us more capacity. For me, some of these life-giving things include just being in nature, gardening. I love playing the piano. You know, being creative is actually a very important part of building our resilience and our capacity to cope. And the C stands for connection. Um, like Sue mentioned earlier, that circle of support. It is very, very important to be with others. Uh, you know, God didn't make us to do life on our own. And especially when we are caring for others and we are caring for people in crisis, we have to be connected. We must get support. So first of all, we have to stay connected to the Lord and we've got to stay connected with others. Keep up the rhythms that you had in your life before you got involved in caring in this situation. And I like to think of sort of connecting with people in two different ways. I know in, in my um, experience of caring for people in crisis, I find it is invaluable to have what I call internal connection, being connected to others who are doing what I'm doing, that shared experience, who understand what I'm going through, that we can debrief with and, and pray with and encourage each other. But also equally important is external connection, being able to connect with others who have nothing to do with what you're doing. Because I find this can help you keep your perspective. They often remind you of the other things in your life. Um, I find my friends sometimes actually help me to laugh at situations and to not be so stressed by situations that I'm in. They help you see the bigger picture. Awareness and balance and connection. And I just want to share with you a really practical tool um, that has been given to us from an organization called Hagar International, who work in Asia uh, with victims and survivors of extreme abuse and human trafficking. And they've done this for a long time and they developed this tool called a safety plan to help their staff deal with this constant pressure of caring for traumatized people. And what it is, it's helping us identify a list of activities that we can choose anytime we begin to feel overwhelmed or exhausted, stressed, or just in a challenging situation. At Hagar, it used to be written on a lanyard that staff wore around their necks so they could see it everywhere. In my ministry for freedom with SIM International, we use a business card size that we had printed that on one side has just some simple self-care tips. And on the other side, my safety plan, one, two, three, four, five. And the process that we can go through with this, and I think the great thing about this activity is that we can do it as an individual, but if you are a church leader or you are in an organization or a ministry and you're in a team situation, this is a very, very practical and powerful way that you can help your team and your workers be able to deal with secondary trauma and overload. So the first process to go through is to think about and identify what types of situations trigger us. What are the things that actually make us feel overloaded, overwhelmed, or stressed, or, oh, I just can't do this anymore? Second thing to identify are what are the signs that you notice or people around you might notice 
when you are starting to become stressed. I know for me, my family have told me that they can tell when I start to get overloaded because the tone of my voice changes. Um, I notice I get very fidgety and inside I just have a sense of, oh, I just want to scream. When I notice those things happening, I need to grab my safety plan because the five things that are on here help me to be able to reduce the intensity of my feelings. So what we need to do then is to identify five things that we can each do to help ourselves cope when we're in challenging situations. And some should involve other people. And at least two should be things that you can do on your own without having to leave your physical space. And then it's to write it on the safety card and have it somewhere that you can refer to often. We use this sort of business card size uh, because people can keep it in their wallet, they can keep it in their phone, but it is there when they need it. And just to give you an example of mine here. So my first tool is I excuse myself and I leave. Excuse me, I'll be back in a couple of moments. I go out, I catch my breath. My second one is I call my husband. And he doesn't often actually have great things to say, but it's just the fact that he's on the other end of the phone and I can unload and talk to him about how I'm feeling. The third one for me is to find nature. And depending on where I am, this may mean going outside. It may mean just looking up at the sky out of a window. And the last two for me, are things that I say as I breathe. One is a reminder. As I breathe in, it's not them. As I breathe out, it's their trauma. It's not them, it's their trauma. And the last one is similar. I do a breath prayer using a scripture that the Lord brings to mind as I breathe in and as I breathe out. And I find these are just very practical tools that can help us be able to care well for others. Marion, I wondered if you would be able to pick up on um, the connection part of this ABC uh, and talk a little bit more around what a debrief actually means and why that is important. Sure, thanks, Sarah. I want to say congratulations to the translators who are still keeping going. Well done, guys. Uh, so the question is, what do we do with the stuff that we see and hear and engage in? Soldiers, policemen, firemen who have been through a traumatic experience are routinely debriefed. What is debriefing and why is it important in the context we're talking about? Well, first, I'm just going to share my screen with you. So debriefing. Debriefing, it's important to say that debriefing is not counselling. It is an intentional conversation. I'm sorry, I'm trying, here we are. Debriefing is an intentional and structured conversation that helps us to tell the story we've engaged in, to share our feelings, to normalise our experiences to learn and reflect on what we have heard and to bring closure to the event. One person said this to me, it's important to be affected by the work we do with survivors, but equally important not to be infected. Sarah there stressed the importance of empathy, but it's very important too that we don't internalize. And one of the dangers of listening to other people's stories and their pain is that we become so involved with it that we make their pain ours. We take it home with us to our families. It intrudes on our thinking and dreaming. To stay healthy, we need to do something with that pain. It is not our pain. If it belongs anywhere, it belongs at the cross. 
we need to distance ourselves from it. And that's where to peer debriefing comes in. So peer debriefing means that at the end of a session, we sit down with a colleague or supportive person and let them lead us through what has happened with seven questions. Question number one. So what happened today? What did you see? What did you hear? Who were you with? Second question. What were you thinking at the time? What was going through your mind as you heard and saw and observed? Third question, what reactions and feelings did you have? What stirred in you? Was it anger? Was it fear? But what were your reactions and your feelings to what you were hearing? Fourth question, what was the hardest part for you? Sometimes the hardest part is actually just keeping quiet and letting the person speak. We feel we have to come in and try and fix something, but so often we're the ones that need to be the sympathetic, engaged listener. So what was the hardest part? Fifth, fifth question is how can we normalize the reactions? We know from some of the other things that we've heard today from Nancy, there are normal reactions to hearing traumatic stories or to trauma. And so we want to help people. We need to be helped to see that these reactions, the things we are experiencing are normal consequences of listening to trauma. Question number six, what will you do next with this situation? What's your next step? So that you can lay it down now and, and put that step where it belongs. And question number seven, where are you going now? Who will be there for you? And after that uh, process, it's helpful to pray with the person who's been listening to you. But then it's really helpful to de-roll. Now, this may be a, a term that you're not familiar with, but de-rolling is stepping away and stepping into your own identity so that you do not carry what is not yours with you. De-rolling de involves asserting your own identity. So at the end of a session, I will say, my name is Marion. I am married to Brian. I have three children. I am a child of God. Our primary identity is in being a child of God, not in all the other various relationships we may be connected to, but that is the one that stands steadfast. And here we are back where we began with Jesus. Just as he found his identity as being the beloved son of his father, so we too remember that to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to be the children of God. Isn't that great? I'm going to hand back now to Caro. Wow, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. Fantastic, starting, you know, that what a journey we've been on, starting with a reminder that, you know, we can all play the martyr. We have to be available all the time. Um, going through various things. Um, really great reminders. Thank you about our environment and uh, nutrition and sleep. Uh, very conscious that I probably need to go and eat after this. So probably a colourful meal. So thank you for that advice, Jerry. Um, excellent use, you know, thinking about the power of images and art and um, in understanding what's happening and how we're feeling. Fantastic. Um, and I love that awareness, balance, connection um, and the safety plans. So, um, before we bring everyone back for any questions that you might have posted in the audience, um, please do pop your questions in if you can. I would just like to do a very quick couple of polls. Um, so firstly, um, we'd just like to know a little bit about who, who's come to, who's, who's attended the webinar, who's joined us this evening. So I'm just gonna ask Richard to put up the poll, the, the poll what, what, what your role is, just to help us understand um, who's who's benefiting from this? So I'm just going to give you a few a few minutes or a minute, literally, just to answer that. Um, 
if your if your answer if your so we've got various options there if your if your option isn't on there um then please just tick other and then type it into the chat for us just so we can have a sense um okay and don't forget if you've done that and you're still sitting there if you've got any questions pop them in the q a uh, or the chat for us okay do we think that's enough time richard perfect thank you oh great so lots of regular volunteers there and a good number of church church mission or ngo leaders excellent and then we've got a few others coming in to uh to the to the chat there thank you very much for that that's really helpful to us oh and a, a new a couple of new volunteers as well brilliant um well welcome and hopefully you'll get a lot out of out of this tonight um and the second poll um we, we just like to know what future sessions, what other options, what things you might like us to do. And please choose up to, I think, three of what you would like to be your next uh, sessions or your future sessions and webinars so that we can begin to meet the needs. Um, so just have a quick through, there's various options there, human trafficking. If there's anything not there that you would really like to know more about, please do um pop us um oh hang on it looks like that people can't see the poll richard i can see it um there's a few people saying they don't see the new poll the future trainings poll can people see it it's on okay so people are answering okay okay we're all right technical technical issue um just one person that can't see it then sorry jennifer um so um yeah please answer a few and if there's something else that's not on there please do pop it in the chat for us great okay i think we'll bring that one to a close richard because we're short on time brilliant thank you ah resilience yes a bit more on a resilience a bit more on advanced trauma care self-care volunteer care human trafficking perfect thank you ever so much for that we'll we'll take that back um and we will we will look at what we do next thank you okay um we are running a bit behind time but we do have the opportunity for uh, a couple of question and answers so can i invite all the panelists to come back on uh, turn their cameras back on and come join me on the screen okay um so the first question that we had um and we've probably got time only got time for a couple um the one of the first questions we had was whether there um it, whether obviously sarah thank you so much for the the safety plan really really useful and there was one question looking at whether there's some other examples of from the other speakers of what might go on a safety plan um any ideas or suggestions would be welcome i can actually put some suggestions um or make them available afterwards it could be things like breathing, some of the breathing and grounding exercises we talked about in our last webinar, we, we can use on ourselves. Um, I had a colleague who, whose primary one was when he started feeling stressed, he counted the holes in the ceiling tiles um, and he found that that was enough to take his mind off things. So it's just simple things that you can do. Again, it's knowing yourself like what works for you um nature mm -hmm. is a good one uh getting up and excusing yourself going and having going and making a drink um of getting a cup of water making a cup of tea practical things that might get you moving that right. distract your thoughts um and get you looking at nature brilliant thank you thank you sarah um um, Marion, I think we have a question specifically for you, just a clarification question. Um, de-rolling, is that for the person being debriefed and or the person facilitating the debrief? Just a bit of clarity on that, please. Okay, sorry. Um, for the person that's actually the, who is, who is being debriefed, the, the other person is really facilitating you being able to take that stage that story out and it and the the idea of de-rolling is that it prevents uh, transference or counter transference at the end of the day that you know that what you go home with is the person that you are not the as it said in that other quote the, the infection of, of 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 what you've heard 
Mm, brilliant. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I think there is a there's a kind of there's a lengthy group of questions here about refugee care. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at it. Um, and I think this might be one of those questions where we we actually just send out the answers at a later date, because I am really conscious of the time now. Um, so I, I've registered your question um, on the refugee situation and we will come to that, but we will we do need to kind of uh, close our session now, I think so. Um, and as we did at the last webinar, we will come back with answers to questions to to people who've who've attended the webinar this evening um, and please also remember that uh, there was a lot of information in tonight's webinar so please um this this is being recorded and will be available to view later um i think you'll all be sent a link for it i don't really know how the technical stuff works as um the team behind the scenes know uh, but i do understand that they will send you a link i think that you can then re-watch the program um, OK, so uh, that just leaves me just now to say um, uh, and we will make slides, notes and recordings available. So, yes, thank you for that clarification, Jennifer. Good job. Someone knows what they're doing. Um, so I would just like to very much thank everybody involved in the presentations tonight uh, to our speakers who have, as ever, been wonderful um, to the behind the scenes team who are uh, incredible and understand technical things, uh, unlike me, um, and to our incredible translators. Thank you so very much. Um, I will just as we move to closing now, I'm going to just hand over to Sheldon um, from the EFN uh, core team. He is is going to uh, give us a few announcements and then close us in a time of prayer and reflection. So um, Sheldon, over to you, thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline. Thanks to you and your team for putting this all together and for hosting us tonight. Um, it's been an amazing webinar. I know I've taken lots of notes. And um, one of the questions I always like to ask myself is what's one thing I'm thinking about now that I wasn't thinking about 90 minutes ago? And maybe that's a question you want to take away with you, as well as what's one thing I'm going to do as a result of what I've heard tonight. If you enjoyed this webinar, there will be another one of, um, coming up on May 5th, same times at, um, as this webinar was at. And the topic will be trauma and anti-trafficking. And so that's six o'clock UK time, seven o'clock Central European time and eight o'clock Eastern European time, May 5th on trauma and anti-trafficking. If you want to stay in touch with other webinars and other news and um, resources that we are producing at EFN, you can subscribe to our newsletter, which is found at uh, europeanfreedomnetwork.org slash subscribe. And we'll put that in the chat. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be uh, kept up to date on all information that we are making available to you. We also have uh, available on the website resources um, to do with trauma care, refugees, help for churches, help for helpers. And you can find that at um, www.europeanfreedomnetwork.org slash Ukraine hyphen trauma. And we'll put that link in the chat as well. And there's some great rapid use uh, resources, downloadables and shareable resources as well. And the safety card that Sarah uh, mentioned is also available for download on that resource page. So you can find a copy of it there. And I encourage you to use that with your team and with yourself as well. As mentioned, the webinar will be available uh, to view again later, and we encourage you just to pass this along. It's been um, made available in different languages, and we will be interpreting it into other languages as we are able to. So watch this with your team, pass it along to others who are working in this field who might not have been able to come tonight. And finally, um, as Carol said, we do want to leave you with a uh, just a blessing and a prayer as you go forward. Take care of yourself as you take care of others. And so just as I read this final blessing, maybe just uh, take a moment, close your eyes and reflect upon the words that are being said. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May we be peacemakers in all that we say and do. Thanks for being part of the webinar. God bless. Spokane in blue, he's an eye, show he eye, a boy. Spokane in blue, he's an eye, show he eye, a Okay, Be still.